Uh, we're so honored to be joined by our good friend and comrade Haider Aid. Uh, Haider is a Palestinian activist, author, and professor at Gaza's Al-Aqsa University. He's a survivor of the Gaza genocide and is speaking to us live from South Africa, where he and his family have fled. Haider, it's so good and such a, an honor uh, to have you. It's been um, it's been just harrowing, uh, you know, trying to be in touch with you when you were in Gaza. Um, and and it's so it's uh, it's really good to see your face. Thank you so much for coming on the live stream today. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Nora. The, the honor is mine. And in fact, uh, you know, I spent the first two months in Gaza and I was worried about Ali Abu Nama <laughs> because he kept sending me messages every single night <laughs> and, you know, wanting to know my whereabouts. And if I get late, you know, if I get uh, back late to him, he would really worry. And so I was worried about him. That was my worry at the time. But uh, yeah, seriously speaking, um, these two months, I, I must admit, the worst two months of my life. And I think that every single Gazan can say the same thing. And uh, as, you, as, you, as you mentioned, Nora, I, I came uh, to South Africa uh, with my wife and my two little kids. The worst part of it was the reaction of the kids. And I have a, I have a seven years old daughter and a six years old daughter. Um, and um, so far, I've been displaced four times with them. I mean, the first time um, when at the beginning of the genocide, uh, the end of the first week, uh, I live in the Rimal neighborhood. And uh, I live in a residential tower, and I was contacted by an Israeli intelligence um, officer working for the Sheen Beit, and he asked us to evacuate. At the time, we misunderstood because we thought that they wanted to bring down the residential tower itself. Luckily, you know, we learned from our experiences, and because of what happened in previous massacres, we decided to put um, our passports and identity cards and the girl's birth certificate and our marriage certificate in a small bag next to the door of the flat, right from the first day of the massacre, of the genocide. So when he called us, we, um, um, and he was, uh, I mean, he knew my name and he said, we want you to leave and head to the north. And at that time, they were shilling the north, in fact. So they were asking us to leave to an area where we would be definitely killed. Uh, we stayed with our neighbors in the um, opposite building. And um, that was the first time they used a new, um, I don't know whether it was new or old, a new military strategy they called, in, in Arabic, they called Hizam Nari, um, um, a fire belt where they attack the area, you know, airstrikes, constant airstrikes for seven or eight hours. So um, we were about, uh, about seven or eight families trapped in one small corridor uh, until the morning, until six o'clock in the morning, uh, inhaling strange gas. And of course, because I used my hand to close my daughter's ears, I lost my hearing. Yeah, so that was uh, that was the price because they didn't know how to do that, and you know they are little kids. So anyway, the following day in the morning, we moved. Uh, we found out that the whole neighborhood was flattened down. The whole neighborhood of Rimal was flattened down. Was our flat was uninhabitable? We had absolutely nothing, and I left my car in the garage uh, under the rubble. Um, we moved to the north to to um, Sheikh Radwan, where I stayed with my brother for three nights, and the same scenario was repeated again. But this time they wanted, you know, the entire population of the Gaza city and the northern part of Gaza, we are talking about 1.1 million people, to move within six or seven hours to the north, uh, to the south. And they posted a map, and that map showed the road on Salah al-Din, uh, Salah al-Din Road actually, uh, from the north to Khan Yunis. Now, when I looked at the map, I didn't notice that it did not include Rafah. So the beginning of the map of the road was from uh, the north 
to Khan Yunus. And so we packed our, you know, all my family, my brother's family, we were about 12 people in a small car. And because everybody was panicking, uh, I needed to be in control. They were expecting me to be in control. So I tried to be in control and I drove without knowing that I was not supposed to reach Rafah, between Khan Yunus and Rafah. And I reached Khan Yunus and I tell you, the, I mean, the scene, it was a repeat of the Nakba. I mean, you know, hundreds of thousands of people on, on, you know, horses, donkeys, trucks, lorries, cars, people walking, halting toddlers. It was, you know, unbelievable, unbelievable. We never thought, we were so naive to believe that, you know, the Israelis wouldn't be able or rather wouldn't be allowed to cross the red line. And to repeat the scenario of the Nakba again. Yes, we were naive. We were very naive. I discussed this with uh, Ali and we agreed. I mean, the world would not allow another genocide. I mean, the only or rather the first genocide in the 21st century. Really. Anyway, my, my brother had, while I was driving, he was sitting next to me with his daughter and his son. And about 10 people were sitting at the back. He had um, a minor heart attack when we crossed from Khan Yunus to Rafah. And the surprise is that we found out that we were the only people on that road. So, of course, I couldn't go back and I had to accelerate. I had to press very hard on the accelerator until we arrived, luckily, I don't know how it happened. We were the only people on the Salah al road between Khan Yunus and Rafah. And we could hear the bombing. And everybody was panicking. And uh, I was trying to help my brother. And then we arrived safely, luckily. Uh, and we stayed with my sister. And the first night we arrived, the Israelis, uh, you know, shelled the house next to my sister's house. And you can't, I, I mean, that was one of the worst night, the second worst night in my life because my kids were screaming and I couldn't do anything. It was dark, of course, in the middle of the night. So it was, you know, I don't want to go on to kind of personal experience, but it's, let's use it as a microcosm. And again, and I said this to Ali so many times, my experience is nothing, nothing compared to the sufferings of the tens, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians and Gazans. I've lost 40 of my cousins with their sons, daughters, nieces, direct cousins, first cousins. And I've lost 40. And again, when I compare to other people, entire families. And by the way, in 2014, we were talking about Israel aiming to, um, you know, wipe out entire families. When we, when we said families at the time, we, we meant nuclear families and now when we say families we are talking about extended families we are talking about clans so when they started targeting the Eids I mean it's not only one Eid it's not one family of the Eids but you know the entire clan so so many clans Al Astal, Abu Shamala etc etc were wiped out wiped out and that was so worrying and and you know, the area where I was staying is not safe, but where can you go? Now, the overwhelming majority of Gazans are staying in Rafah because initially they were asked to move to the south, to the, to the middle areas. The middle areas include, you know, the Nusayrat refugee camps, al Buraj refugee camps, al Maghazi, and Deir al Balah. And now they are attacking the middle areas and people are only left with one option to move to the south. The south is Khan Yunus and Rafah. But, but Khan Yunus itself is under heavy bombardment right now. It has been since the beginning, by the way, since the beginning of this genocide. And now more than two thirds of Gazans are staying. You know, I'm in contact with people. I mean, people are sleeping on the street. People are swimming uh, on the streets and uh, under the trees. Uh, uh, am I losing you? Sorry, I can't see you. Well, we can still see you. 
Yeah, no, because I lost you. I don't know. I can't see you anymore. We, we, can, still, anyway. we can still hear you, Haidar. I can, yeah, yeah. So, so now, um, you know, the only question before before I finish, uh, look, it's uh, it's very traumatic, and uh, it has been a very traumatizing experience uh, for myself, for my family, for my friends, for every uh, single Gazan I know. And um, when I was contacted at the beginning, uh, at the beginning of the massacre, look, I've been through all massacres all the massacres since 2008, 2012, 2014, 2021, and the Great March of Return. And every single time, uh, because I have dual citizenship, the South African embassy in Ramallah uh, would contact me and ask me whether I would want to leave. And every single time I said no. Uh, well, I didn't have kids at the time. Now, this time I lost my house. Um, you know, I lost my name. We lost Gaza. We've lost Gaza. Gaza is gone. Gaza is gone. You know, according to Wall Street reports, it will take, uh, you know, uh, it will take us to remove, it will take us one year to remove the rubble and to reconstruct Gaza between eight and 10 years. I mean, according to reports, reliable reports by, by the Wall Street Journal. So when they contacted me at the beginning, the embassy, I mean, they contacted me at the beginning of the massacre, uh, I, you know, myself and Drifka, my wife, we said, no, we are staying with our families. Uh, and, and then after a mo one month after that, they contacted again. And that was the time when I started seeing serious psychological uh, I would call them, uh, you know, traumatic changes in my, you know, my kids, my two kids. And that was the time when we had a very serious discussion, myself and my partner, and we decided to take that offer. Um, foreign nationals and uh, dual citizen, uh, people with dual citizenship, had already started moving. At the beginning, Israel decided to close all the crossings, including the only exit Palestine, uh, Gaza has to the external world, and that is the Rafah crossing. Uh, the Egyptians were threatened by the Israelis, and therefore they decided to close the Rafah crossing. Everybody knows the story. But later on, uh, with some pressure from the colonial West, because they wanted to take their citizens out of Gaza, uh, the, beginning with you know uh, Americans, then Canadians, Germans, etc., South Africans were left to the end because Israel wanted to punish South Africa for the stance taken by the South African government, reducing diplomatic ties, etc. And I can say with very clear, very clear conscience now, and I'm very, I'm 100% sure now that um, had they waited until the ICJ case last week, we would have never been allowed to leave Gaza. Full stop. Impossible. So anyway, I left with my uh, my two kids. And you know the drive between Rafah and uh, uh, Cairo, El Qahira. It's a five-hour drive. It took us twenty-eight hours. And upon arrival in Cairo, we were terribly exhausted, almost fainting. Um, we were. Um, we stayed for three, four hours. Then we were taken to the airport. We flew to Johannesburg via Addis Ababa. And what I, I, what I want to tell you is that I'm still feeling very, very conflicted, very ex extremely conflicted. And um, I think it has something to do with that. And I'm conscious of that. This is the point. I don't want to deny it. It's the, uh, the survivors' uh, guilt complex. And now we have to start a new life. Today was the girl's first day at school. And it's not easy. You know, language, a new environment, a new culture. Luckily, the girls speak English. They know English because I used to communicate with them in English and Fusha Arabi in, 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 in Gaza. Uh, but also, uh, I, I, I came last year with them and decided to, uh, to visit South Africa for three weeks and to expose them, you know, to this multiracial, multicultural environment. So it, it has been a little bit difficult, 
but not as bad as I expected. And this is why we need to spend more time with them. And of course, you know, finding a flat with the support of our comrades here, it has been easy, I must say that. Uh, I'm trying to find a new job after I retire. That will be in April. Um, so that's my story from beginning to end. I hope I didn't bore you. Haidar, I, the only thing I can say is Alhamdulillah, Assalamualaikum. I, ca I, I can't begin to uh, fathom, and it, it may well take you years to begin to cope with the levels of trauma and grief and the feelings, as you put it to me in a previous conversation, of, of, of survivor's guilt. And um, But I, I have to say, first of all, that uh, while you were in Gaza, um, I was amazed that through all that horror that you experienced, horror that none of us can, except those who've been through it, can relate to, you continued your work. You continued to write. You continued to speak out. I was always relieved and comforted when I saw you sharing articles and comments and analyses on WhatsApp. And I have to tell you that uh, on uh, on the day, it was uh, December 5th, I'm looking at the message now, you sent me a message, Marhaban Ali, وصلت للتو جنوب إفريقيا بعد معانات كبيرة. Hello Ali, I just arrived in South Africa after great suffering. And that was on December 5th, and I felt a great sense of relief when I got that message from you. Um, two days later, we would learn that actually on the next day, December 6th, Israel murdered our dear friend Rifat. And uh, that, th that, that's something we will never forgive or forget. And uh, we wish he could be here with us in this conversation. And we're just gr grateful and happy to have you here. And we wish you and Rifqa and the girls, all the best. And we pray night and day that everyone in Gaza, everyone in Gaza will be safe. And no one will ever begrudge you that safety. No one will say you should have stayed in that hell if there was a way out. And uh, you are as such, a, you have been for so many years, Haidar, such an important voice uh, for our people, for our cause. Uh, for the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. And if you allow me to say that with all the trauma that you have been through, I don't think you waited more than a day or two days in South Africa before you continued your work with speeches, with rallies, with media appearances. And we need your voice in this world, and we need the whole world to hear it. So Thank you, Haidar, and thank you for putting up with all my annoying WhatsApp messages. You had quite enough to deal with. But uh, let, thank me you, just say, let me just say uh, that uh, I just, coming to uh, the recent, uh, the events of last week at the ICJ, I, I just want to read a sentence or two from a piece you wrote recently for Al Jazeera, you wrote, we Palestinians will not forget the sickening cowardice of the so-called international community, which has allowed and enabled this genocide. We will not forget how the nations of the world stood idly by as Israel's racist leaders openly claimed that we, the indigenous people of Palestine, the Amalek, the foe, that according to the Torah, God ordered the ancient Israelites to commit genocide against. You also wrote, but we will never forget what South Africa did for us. We will not forget how it showed us unwavering support and bravely took a stand for us at the world court when even our own brothers have turned our backs on us in fear. So I just want you to say a little bit more, Haidar, about what it was like both for you as a Palestinian and a South African to see this, what was the mood in South Africa, and. Uh, what do you hope will come from this? Yeah, well, um, you know, Ali, um, I mean, um, you know very well that there is a context. 
and that context is you know in a way historical um you if you remember when uh, when israel decided to redeploy its troops around gaza of course they call it withdrawal and we call it uh, redeployment surrounding gaza and transforming it into uh, into a concentration camp um, I don't like to say, uh, you know, the largest open air prison because it's not an open air. I don't know what open air prisons uh, are, but I know what concentration camps are because I lived in a concentration camp. So Gaza was a concentration camp. And all of that happened in 2006 when we were asked to head to the polling stations and vote for our representatives. And when I say our representatives, I'm not talking about you, Ali. Uh, about Tamar, I'm, no, I'm talking about the residents of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. Because Oslo, the Oslo Accords actually, um, reduced the Palestinian people to only those who live in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. So people went to the polling station, but not myself. I refused to vote because I don't believe that you can have true democracy under the barrel of the gun of a Zionist soldier. I am opposed to, legit, to elections under occupation and settler colonialism. But anyway, people, again, were naive to head to the polling stations, voting, not voting for a party, voting against a policy, against the two-state solution, against the Oslo Accords, against corruption. In other words, they voted against the will of the occupation and against the will of the United States of America, the enablers of occupation, the enablers of genocide. And this is why apartheid Israel in cahoot with reactionary Arab regimes and its enablers and supporters in the colonial West decided to impose this, you know, deadly medieval siege on, on, on the people, on, on Gazans. Now that was, that was the beginning of the context that I, uh, that I'm referring to. Israel wanted to test the water of the international community. If it carries out a war crime, a crime against humanity, how would the international community react? And this is why in 2006, uh, Israel committed, excuse me, um, you know, the Beit Hanun massacre. The, the international community did absolutely nothing. Then 2008, 2009, for 22 days, committing a horrific crime, killing more than 1,200 civilians, including 400 children. And what was the reaction of the international community? Nothing, nothing. The international community stood idle. And therefore Israel decided to repeat th the same thing on, in 2012. And then in 2014, killing more than 2,200 people, um, almost um, half of them are children and women. And the international community, and, and when I talk about the international community, I'm talking about official bodies, official bodies of the international community. The international community blamed us, it blamed the victim. In other words, <coughs> the colonial West decided to endorse the Zionist narrative, regardless of the losses of, you know, um, lives of civilians and children and women. And, and this is why what happened is that on the 7th of October, I myself, if you remember Ali, I mean, people, um, youngsters who grew up, you know, between 2000, I mean, 2006, they were four years old and five years old. They grew up in this extermination camp. They know no other reality, no other world. They did everything, begged the international community, the Arabs, to put an end to this deadly siege. Nothing happened. Thousands of people died as a result of this deadly siege. And therefore, they decided to break the walls of our Warsaw Ghetto, the Gaza Ghetto, the Gaza Ghetto on the 7th of October. And then that was used as an excuse to carry out this ongoing genocide. Now, we expected the international community to do something. War crimes, crimes against humanity, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, even B'Tselem called Israel an apartheid state, apartheid state. And what is the reaction of the international community? Absolutely nothing. As I'm speaking to you right now, a, a Palestinian child is being killed.
By the time we finish this interview, between 15 and 20 Palestinian children in Gaza will be dead. Definitely. These are the statistics. And I think because of the joint history and the common history of struggle against apartheid and against settler colonialism, South Africa has decided to say enough is enough. The South African government, of course, is, you know, is a democratically elected government. Civil society organizations in South Africa, uh, our comrades in the solidarity movements here, you have solidarity movements, the BDS coalition, exerted pressure. And I, I know for years they have been exerting pressure on the South African government to cut its diplomatic ties with uh, apartheid Israel until it complies with international law. I mean, there is nothing wrong with that. This is the call made by the overwhelming majority of Palestinian civil society, including, you know, nationalist, uh, nationalist forces in Palestine. Now, this hey, has uh, been going on. Thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit like, leave a comment. These engagements help us with the YouTube algorithm and it helps us to get around Silicon Valley censorship as much as possible. It does make a difference. You can also support our journalism by going to electronicintifada.net and clicking on donate now. Thank you.